Well, if you have your Bibles, let's turn together to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. In the bulletin, it's verses 17 through 21, which is correct. That's the bulk of my sermon this morning. But I want to back up a little bit to verse 12 and read beginning in verse 12. And I'm going to actually read through chapter 4, verse 1, just so we have the full flow here. Philippians chapter 3, again, beginning in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this. Or am already perfect. But I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind. And straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me. and Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many, of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I pray uh, that you would help me uh, preach with clarity and with compassion and sincerity. And I pray that your spirit will be at work among us, your people, as we hear your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, if you've ever been around babies and toddlers, you know that it's delightful. There's just, there's a hymn, Because He Lives. The second verse opens with, How sweet to hold a newborn baby. Boy, no truer words uh, have been, or been written by Bill Gaither. Well, I shouldn't say that. He wrote a lot of true words. But how sweet to hold a newborn baby. We, everybody loves babies, I think. I've never met anybody that didn't. And one of the joys of being a parent is watching your children grow. And so there's great delight in seeing them develop and take their first steps. That's a big deal, right? When our daughters, we lived in Kentucky and all the grandparents lived down here in Georgia. So when they were taking their first steps, you know, we take videos, try to Skype or FaceTime those first steps, those first words, the first songs they would sing. And there's something endearing about the first time they can use the potty without assistance. That's always a relief. When they read their first book without mom or daddy's help, that's a big deal. And when you hear those words for the first time from a seven-year-old, Daddy, I colored in the lines all by myself. Your heart beams with pride from a seven-year-old. But if your 17-year-old says, Daddy, I colored in the lines all by myself, uh, you might scratch your head a little bit. They wouldn't give you the same sense of pride and accomplishment. You know, it's one thing for a five-year-old to go outside and say, Daddy, airplane. But if your 25-year-old child said, Daddy, airplane, you say, like, eh, we, got, we got some growing up here to do. Well, likewise, we expect, just as we expect our children to grow in maturity, and we delight in that, you know, the Bible calls us to grow in maturity, to not remain as infants and babes in the faith, but to grow and to progress into Christian maturity. And so Paul says in 17, join in imitating me. 
Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. And what is this example? It's what he talked about in verses 12 through 16. And he says in verse 15, let those of us who are mature think in this way. We should all want to imitate and aspire to be mature Christians. You know, one of the phenomenon of our day is uh, <laughs> it's really quite hilarious on social media uh, and, and even in real life. I encounter, and you probably have too, people in their 20s, sometimes even early 30s, who complain about this idea called adulting. You know, you don't have to be on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, I mean, this very long, and you'll see people in their 20s like, oh, adulting is so hard. I never heard of this term adulting until about 10 years ago, and I'm like, what are they talking about adulting? Well, they just mean doing common, everyday things that any adult should be perfectly competent to do and not make a big deal out of. You like, you know, like go grocery shopping, pay your bills, load the dishwasher, do your laundry. I saw... <laughs> Just a, a quick survey. I just decided to, eh, let me just search some posts from family members and friends. And uh, I came across some of these from people I know that have posted in the recent years. One of them said, I'm not going to tell you their names because it would embarrass me. Uh, one of them said this, I woke up feeling cranky, but I decided not to skip work today. Hooray adulting. Well, good for you. Another friend of mine uh, posted this. I, I, these are my friends, folks. These are not people I'm picking on that I don't know. It's worse, I'm sure. This guy says, today was my day off from work, but I had to renew my car tags, go grocery shopping, pay my car insurance bill. I'm not fond of adulting. It's like, what did you expect to sit around in your pajamas all day, eating Fruit Loops, watching cartoons? Like, grow up, dude. You, I'm, nobody's proud of you for just being a normal, competent adult. Well, there's much I could say about that. That's not the point of my sermon. But when we see this arrested development, by the way, there has been much ink on many pages about the problem of young people in the United States of this arrested development where they ought to be mature adults. They shouldn't be looking for a gold star because they emptied the litter box for their cat. That's just normal adult behavior that doesn't deserve kudos, right? And it's one thing if you have to prod and poke a teenager to do that. We expect that. That's okay. They're still growing. But an adult, like, come on. And so we see this problem in our day and age. And we, you know, if you've got any level of maturity, you kind of scratch your head about it. But what about in the church? What about those people who have been in the church, been born again, walked with the Lord for a long time, but then they're still immature in their faith? We can, we can have compassion. We want to bring those people along, but we also should be scratching our heads a little bit about, hey, you know, you've been a Christian for a while now. It's time to grow up. It's time to mature. It's time to live like a sincere, devoted follower of Christ. And so in our text this morning, Paul shows us what this looks like to live in Christian maturity. And I've really just got two points this morning. The first is this, we see a picture of Christian progress and maturity. And then the second point will be, we're going to see a picture of a godless failure. Hopefully that point is much shorter. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. But let's, let's consider these two things from our passage this morning. First, a picture of Christian progress and maturity. And there's a couple things here. First is this, we need to recognize each one of us. As we're progressing, as we're straining for maturity, that each of us is a work in progress. Have you ever thought about that? As a Christian, you've not arrived. You are a work in progress. Uh, this is the main idea of verses 12 through 17. Paul here lays his heart bare, and he says, Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but what I press on to make it my own. He recognizes that even as sincere of a believer, in fact, an apostle that he was, he had not arrived. He was still himself, a work in progress. Christ was at work in him and working through him. He had, he had not reached perfection. Uh, in the very beginning of the letter in Philippians 1, 6, we even saw him say this about the Philippians. He said, I'm confident of this 
that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So it's not just Paul that's a work in progress. All of us are. You are. I am. The most seasoned of saints among us is still growing in grace, still growing in their knowledge of Christ and should be aspiring to know him better. Now, in chapter 3, verse 12, I want us to just look at this in detail here. He says, not that I have already obtained this. Now, what is the this he's talking about in verse 12? So it's clearly something from the preceding passage that we looked at last week. So just by way of reminder, I want to go back just a little bit and read verses 7 through 11. Because we, we got to understand, what does he say that I, he has not obtained? So let's understand what he's saying. So in verse 7, he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I'd suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible... I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, when Paul says now in verse 12, not that I've already obtained this, there's a couple of options, but I want to make this very clear. He is not saying, he is not saying that he has not obtained salvation. He is not saying that he has not obtained what we would call justification. This past week on Wednesday night, we looked at the doctrine of salvation, and we talked about justification. If you were here, I'm going to rehash a little bit of that. But justification is our right standing with God. It's when God legally declares us not guilty because our sins have been put on Christ. And it's when he doesn't just declare us not guilty. He declares us righteous because Christ's righteousness has been awarded to us. So Paul has obtained that. So when he says in verse 12, not that I've already obtained this, he does not mean that he's not yet justified, that he has to strive towards being saved in his right relationship with God. No, that is accomplished for you, for Paul, for me, and for all who will believe the moment they repent and have faith. So we can have confidence that we are saved, not based on how much we grow or how good we are, but because God is declares us righteous in Christ when we repent and trust him in faith. That is obtained for every believer once and for all. And so this is not what he means. Instead, he's referring, I think, specifically to verses 10 and 11, which speak of him wanting to grow in his Christ-likeness. So in verse 10, what does he say? That I may know him. Now, he knows Christ in part, but only in part. He doesn't know him fully the way he wants to and longs to. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. In other words, Paul says, that's what I haven't fully obtained yet. I want that. I want to know him better than I know him today. Certainly better than I knew him yesterday. Better than I knew him 30 years ago. I want to know him more. And he says, I want to share in his sufferings more than I did yesterday and the day before. Now, that's a little bit harder to say, isn't it? But why? Because the longing, as we've said the past couple of weeks, the longing of every Christian heart above all things is not to go to heaven it's not to be righteous personally, but it's to know Jesus. That's the longing of the heart of a Christian. And so what Paul is talking about here is another aspect of salvation, which is our sanctification. We also talked about that this past Wednesday night. So what Paul is saying in our passage here is that he is a work in progress. Christ has begun the good work in him. The Holy Spirit is renewing him and transforming him, convicting him of sin, convicting him of righteousness. He's aspiring toward maturity in the gospel, laying aside sins that have plagued him that maybe are brought to his attention for the first time. 
And he's not satisfied with where he is today. He hasn't reached a point where he says, you know what? I know Christ good enough. You know what? I, I reached a point now I'm holy enough. I don't, I don't need to get any better. I don't need to know the scripture any better. I pray enough. I've done enough. What he says is, I want to pour myself out in every possible way that I may know Jesus Christ the way he fully knows me. That's the longing of my heart. And I press toward that. I work toward that. I strive toward that. Because there's nothing better that will give me more joy. There's nothing that will make him happier than to do this. Uh, the pastor, John Piper, has coined a phrase. I think he coined it. I never read anyone say it before him. This idea of Christian hedonism. Now, let me just pump the brakes here. You hear the word hedonism, and you think about the passage that we read in 1 Peter together. People who just pursue wanton pleasure at every turn, whatever pleasure they can possibly get from life itself to satisfy the desires of the flesh. What John Piper means when he talks of Christian hedonism is this. The joy you get in Jesus is greater than the joy you can get from anything else. And so if you want the maximum joy you can possibly have in life, pursue him as much as you possibly can, because that will bring you more delight. And so it's a simple way of saying we were created to know God and to enjoy him. And so therefore, pursue your joy. So this is what Paul is essentially saying here. Now, when we get saved, we are immediately declared righteous by God by virtue of our faith and, and repentance, and trusting in him. We're, we're born again. But we're not immediately, perfectly changed into the image of Christ. I think any of us, all of us, can look back and we can see the day. Maybe you remember the day and the hour, or at least the season of life when you first came to know the Lord. And you can look back and say, you know what? I, I, I loved the Lord then. I was sincere then, but boy, he's sweeter to me now. And I know more scripture now. I understand the Bible better now. My prayer life is better now. Now, just a quick caveat. If that's not you, by all means, I'm not trying to heap a burden upon you or to lay some load upon your conscience. As a matter of fact, if you're a believer and you look at your life now and you see that maybe you're not as devoted to the Lord as you were when you first got saved, uh, I, don't, I don't have to worry about heaping a burden on you because you will, you will naturally feel a burden about that. That's not me putting a burden on your conscience. That's just because we, we have the Holy Spirit within us. And when we don't walk as closely with the Lord as, as we used to, we feel a burden about that. That's a, by the way, let me just say, that's a godly sense of shame or embarrassment. Hear me very clearly. That's a, that's a godly sense of shame or embarrassment. I'll give you an analogy. If you're a husband or a wife, I think back to that lovely, bubbly uh, season of life when you first get married, you're in your honeymoon phase. And man, you do anything for your wife. Let me do the dishes. No, no, let me do that. Let me make the bed for you. Husband, do you remember this season? You couldn't wait to buy your wife flowers, write her notes. You know, you're in that stage. Well, if you look back, let's say you've been married any length of time, 10, 20, 30 years. You look back and you see that season of life and you're like, oh man, you know, I used to be a good husband. I need to go back to doing some of those things. That's not a bad feeling. You should say, yeah, yeah, I need to rediscover that. It's not bad to feel that way. And so likewise, as Christians, if we can look back on when we first got saved and all that joy and enthusiasm and zeal for Christ, and if you feel, eh, I don't have that as much today, that could be the Holy Spirit gently prompting you to return to your first love. There is such a thing as the grace of shame, or, or better yet, the grace of regret or embarrassment. Don't run from that. Lean into it. Let the Lord use that. To bring you back to him. It's okay. All of us have been there. You're not the only Christian who has ever had his heart grow dull or cold. So don't be ashamed. And don't run away from Christ. Let the Lord use that to draw you back to him. You can go back to him now. You can, you can go back right now to being close to the Lord. Well, what he's saying is this though. The Holy Spirit changes some aspects of our life immediately when we get saved. But... For the most part, he works on us slowly over time. And we should lean into that process. 
When the Holy Spirit brings us to life, he does a radical work within us. But it's a work that will succeed in its completion. Paul has confidence. I, I don't know if you catch this in, in this text. Yes, he's saying, I'm striving toward that. I'm pushing toward that. But he has confidence that ultimately the Lord is going to grant that to him. That it's the Lord that does this work of sanctification. And the Holy Spirit never leaves a job undone. The same Holy Spirit that convicted you of sin, gave you faith, that prompted you to repent and trust Christ, that brought you to life when you were regenerated, that Holy Spirit, who is God, will complete the work he began. He's not going to leave you as an unfinished project. And so, Paul is saying in verse 12, I'm not there yet. But God's not done with me. And he's given me the strength and the energy to keep fighting the faith, uh, fighting for the faith, fighting for progress. So Paul says, I strive, I press on. He says, one thing I do in verse 13, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. That's what he does. He doesn't sit back and wait for God to overcome him. And in the meantime, he's just going to fritter away his life. No, he leans into it, brothers and sisters. Now, I want to ask you this morning, just rhetorically, you think about this in your own heart. Do you recognize in your life that you are a work in progress? Do you see that? Now, I'm asking this in a couple of ways. Uh, first of all, let me, let me bring it home in this application. When you sin, do you beat yourself up and cover yourself with condemnation? I've known some Christians who do this. They, they walk with the Lord inevitably, invariably. We all stumble. We all will sin. And when they do, they go into just this slough of despondency. And they become overcome with their guilt. Notice what Paul, I've got an encouraging word for you here this morning, if that's you. If you have a tender conscience that is burdened, overburdened by your sin, notice what Paul says. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. And straining toward what lies ahead. You don't have to live very long to have some serious regrets about your life. We all have them. We all have things that if it were publicly displayed on this screen up here for everybody to see, we'd be very embarrassed about. But you know what? The Lord knows them. He knows all those things intimately. And he forgives us. And he loves us. And he's accepted us. You don't have to live in a past identity of sin. No, 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 no. We have to recognize we're a work in progress. So when we do sin, we confess them, we repent of them. If necessary, we go to the person we sinned against and we make it right. But then we look ahead and we string toward knowing Christ more today. The other thing, too, about being a work in progress is we must all be willing to lay aside a sin. If a sin gets brought to your attention by another believer, sometimes that's not pleasant, or maybe by circumstance, or sometimes directly by the Holy Spirit, just bringing it to your heart. Are we willing to say, you know what? I am clay in the potter's hands. This is a sin that's brought to my attention. I need to lay it down. I need to say no to it. I recently heard a story of a, of a man who was confronted by another brother in Christ in love about some things he was doing wrong, just running over people and some other things. And he said, well, I'm sorry you don't like me, but I'm not going to change who I am for anybody. I just want to say, I don't know this man. I've heard it secondhand. I would just want to say to that man, maybe you felt that way. I just want to say, well, would you change for Jesus? Are you willing to change for Jesus? Forget about changing to make other people happy. Do you think when you harbor or pet a sin or a bad habit or a bad attitude that it honors Jesus? And if Jesus looked you in the face and said, I want you to stop doing this or stop behaving this way. I want you to go apologize to that person. If he looked you in the face and said that, would you do it? Or would we say to Jesus, well, I ain't changing for nobody. I think we know the answer. And so we're a work in progress. We need to be willing to lay down our sins. Willing to move beyond them. Willing to grow in grace. Eager to grow in grace. And, and let me say this other point too. Are you 
Do you recognize that others are a work in progress? I think sometimes I've, I've known Christians who fall into this camp who they love when people show them grace. They love when people give them, cut them some slack. But boy, you let somebody offend them. You let somebody run over them. And man, all bets are off. They're quick to say, hey, the Lord's working on me. But sometimes they fail to see, you know what? The Lord's working on them too. We need this in our church. Every church needs this. We're not unique in this way. You can look up and down your pew, look across the room. The people in this room, I got, a, I got breaking news for you. This might come as a shock. The people in this room are going to sin against you. Did you know that? The people on your pew are one day going to hurt your feelings. They are one day going to do or say something that is wrong, and it directly makes your day worse. How are you going to respond? You know, we read in our scripture passage again in 1 Peter, what is the last sentence here? He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. You know, when we think about being a work in progress, growing toward Christian maturity, we have to extend that to others as well. And so when they say hurtful word, when they step on our toes, maybe, maybe there's a job in the church you really like doing and it seemed like somebody else encroached on you and pushed you out. They may not have had any clue that they did any of those things. So we want to show love and grace and compassion. Maybe have a tough conversation about it, sure. But we have to strive toward Christian maturity in this way. And so we don't want to hold other sins against them. Uh, I hate to use so many bad illustrations from church life, but I recently heard of another illustration I just want to point out because I think it's helpful for us. I, I heard of a church in Florida so it's not too far away. And this was recent. There was a deacon in this church who had faithfully walked with the Lord for well over 30 years. And some of the people in the church became aware of the fact that before this man was even a Christian. So this is 30 years prior, more than 30 years prior. Before he became a Christian, this man lived a very wicked lifestyle. He was an adulterer. He was a womanizer. He was a drunkard. And so it came to light that before he even knew Christ, before he was married to his wife of 30 plus years, that he had been just a pretty filthy guy. And when the church heard about this, some people in the church leadership were scandalized and they removed him from being a deacon. They actually said, hey, what you did 35 years ago, man, that disqualifies you from being a deacon. And they removed him. Now, I don't want to get the particulars of this situation because I don't know the church but let me just say, brothers and sisters, as we think about extending grace to people, we also have to remember that we are a new creation in Christ. And there was a time for all of us when we walked in sin. Some of us deeper than others. But now that we're in Christ, we can show fellowship to one another as those who've been born again. And I just want to say to you, if before your life in Christ, you lived in a way that would embarrass you, you should feel no judgment here at church. Because Christ, if he can accept you, if he can forgive you, then we as a church are to welcome you as a brother and sister in the Lord. Now, this leads me to the second part of this picture of a godly example, which is this. We ought to imitate the example of other believers. So one of the portraits of Christian maturity is that mature Christians... Strive to live like other mature Christians. So Paul says this in uh, verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. And then in verse 17, brothers join in imitating me. But not just me. Look at what he says. And keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. You know, we saw Paul talk about this idea of copying, of imitating or emulating other believers. He brought this up all the way back in chapter 1 with the example of himself. In chapter 2, he gave us the example of Jesus. He said, have this mind of yours among yourselves, which is yours in Christ. End of chapter 2, he gives the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus. This is all through the letter. And so wise Christians need to be looking for other believers who are faithful in their walk. And they need to say, hey... I want to be like her. I want to be like him. 
Now, we talked about this in, in pretty good detail at the end of chapter 2, so I don't want to belabor this point and just retread all that ground. But I do want to say this. You know, if you wanted to be a great fisherman, really good at fishing, what would you do? I mean, you can watch YouTube videos in this day and age. You could go to the library and pick up a book. But if you really want to be a great fisherman, what you're going to do is you're going to find other people who are good at fishing, and you're going to say, hey, can I go fishing with you? Will you show me the equipment you use? Man, let me see that bait. Let me see that tackle. How are you casting? How do you know what time to go fishing? Hey, what bait do you use to get which fish? You're going to pepper them with a million questions. And at first, you're just going to try to copy everything they do. And you know what? Nobody's going to think you're weird or oddball for that. They're going to think, hey, this person really wants to learn how to fish. Now, if we know to do that with fishing, or being a carpenter, or being good at knitting, or quilting, or cooking, we know that in our life. I wonder why we don't do it as much in the church. I, I want to encourage you, find an older believer. And by older, I just mean someone who's walked with the Lord longer than you. Maybe they're actually younger in age. Find them and say, hey, I want to know. You know, I don't read the Bible as well as I should. I don't understand as well as I should. Tell me what you do. What's your Bible reading plan? Maybe you want to find one of the older ladies in the church and say, hey, you know what? I struggle to have a good, consistent prayer life. Can you tell me some practical tips of how you pray, how you remember to pray, how you find time to do it. Will you help me? There's so much that we can learn from other believers if we would just lean in and ask them questions. And you know what? No one's going to think you're weird for that. But it feels weird, doesn't it? Doesn't it just kind of feel weird? The thought of going up to a, a man in the church and saying, Brother Paul, I, I want to know my Bible the way you do. Will you tell me your Bible reading plan. Or Brother Eldon, I want to pray with the same passion and devotion that you do, the same uh, vigor. Will you talk to me? How do you pray? Will you teach me to pray? That seems kind of weird, doesn't it? But I want to say to you, it shouldn't. That's what children do when they're growing up. They want to be just like mama and daddy. And we as believers, we should look up to our mothers and fathers in the faith and say, hey, teach me, show me. By the way, I uh, just want to say, we are blessed as a congregation to have so many seasoned saints. That's a blessing. That's, that is wonderful. I, I, <laughs> I feel compelled to say this, and this might offend people who maybe who are watching. I don't think it will offend anybody in our room. If it does, I apologize. But I, no, I don't apologize. Here we go. For the past 20 years, I have seen so much marketing from church plants and new churches with slogans like, not your grandma's church. And I want to just stop and say, not my grandma's church. You mean my grandma's church that faithfully prayed for me since I was in my mother's womb? Not like that. You mean not like my grandmother's church who gave sacrificially to support missionaries and orphanages and medical clinics who donated back to school items every year for underprivileged kids? You mean not like that grandma's church? You mean not like my grandmother's church who sang robust songs with deep theological truths that will actually carry you through a season of trial and depression? You mean not like that? I don't think we're sufficiently, as Christians at large, offended by the notion of not your grandmother's church. As if our generation suddenly stumbled upon what it means to be a faithful Christian. Excuse me. Now, I don't mean to imply that the 1950s were the peak of Christianity and the peak of the church. But if you go back and you look at what the generations that came before us did. What they said is not, hey, be like us. They said, we want to do it the way the generations before us did it. And those generations said the same thing. Why? Because the gospel we believe is an ancient gospel. The church is an ancient church. And these efforts to be new and different and to cast off the old, we better heed the warning of G.K. Chesterton. He was a British commentator, and he said, before you tear down a fence, you better know why that fence was put up. And I don't mean to get so emotional and rant and rave about it, but it makes me angry. I'm sorry if I 
got a little angry there. Was the generation before us, were they perfect? No, they weren't perfect. And the generation before them wasn't perfect either. But we need to be humble as believers. Always, not just trying to find out the way grandma did it. But we need to find out why grandma believed what she believed about the Bible. And it's not the 1950s that's our goal. It's the New Testament era of the church. If we could do it exactly the way they did it, that would be the standard. Not the new flashy ways. Now, I, I have to give this disclaimer. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy a screen. Goodness, that makes it easier to sing. It doesn't mean we can't have air conditioning. As a matter of fact, it's great that we live in a day and age where we have apps on our phones with the Bible. That's fantastic. Our grandparents couldn't have dreamed of that. We, we have so many advantages to being a Christian that are great because of the day and age we live in. There was a time when radio broadcasts of preaching was brand new and cutting edge. That's great. Now you can get them on podcasts, not just on the radio, but through YouTube and a million other places. Absolutely, we can do things in new ways. But we must never forget that we have an ancient faith that goes all the way back to Abraham and before. We should not jettison all of that in the name of being new and cutting edge and shame on us if we ever think that we're the first generation that figured anything out well that was free that wasn't even where I intended to go this morning let me get back on track here so we want to grow into Christian maturity and we want to lean into those who came before us learn from them apply the lessons that they can tell us Yes, that's what I was talking about. Let me just, let me close this section here with a couple of questions. One, are you seeking to imitate other godly men and women in the church and, and in the faith? Maybe they don't go to church. Here. Maybe you've got a coworker who's a, a very mature Christian. Are you seeking to imitate them? Secondly, are you seeking to be a godly model for others? You know, young people, if you're in your 50s, 40s, 30s, one day you're going to be, Lord willing, in your 70s and 80s. Strive now to be the kind of believer in your 80s that people in their 50s want to talk to and learn from. Likewise, people in your teens and 20s, strive now to be someone in your 40s that teenagers want to talk to and learn from. Start now. Don't wait. You're not going to magically wake up one day and just be a mature Christian without working at it. Now, well... I went way too long on that point, but I do want to touch on what else is in our scripture here, and I want to try to be brief. It's brief in the text, so I'm going to be brief with it, but I am going to bring it up. And that's this, a picture of godless failure. So we see this portrait of godly maturity, striving, pressing in, imitating other believers, walking faithfully, standing firm, all of those things. But we see in verse 18 and 19 a picture of godless failure. Paul says this, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So who's Paul talking about here? Well, clearly, I think we can categorically say these are unbelievers. How do we know that? Well, he says their end is destruction. So destruction, not salvation. He says their God is their belly. So they are hedonists in the sense that they're just seeking pleasure, similar to what we read in 1 Peter 4. He says they glory in their shame. That is, they're proud. They're proud of the filth in their lives. They enjoy it. They want you to enjoy it. They try to promote filth and degeneracy. They glory in their shame. They at least defend it. And he says their minds are set on earthly things. So that's in contrast to heavenly things and eternal matters. In other words, these are people that are, for all intents and purposes, living for the here and now. Some perhaps more obviously than others. But it's a category of people who don't really know the Lord and they're awaiting a terrible fate. Now we see this obviously with people outside of the faith. We, we see this on display. I don't have to give you illustrations or examples of this. But many commentators think, and I agree with them, I don't think Paul primarily has here in mind people outside 
of the church. I think he's thinking of people in the church who have made a profession, at least with their lips. Maybe they walked an aisle, they prayed a prayer. They think they're saved. At least they've deceived themselves. Maybe they even deceive other people. But there is zero evidence in their life of any godliness, any Christian maturity. It's not there. You look for fruit, you won't find it. So Paul is saying, many of whom I have often told you and now tell you with tears that they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. I want to say we, we shouldn't be surprised by this. The scripture in many places warns us about people who will be in the church, give all the right words, go through the motions, but their hearts are not with the Lord. And ultimately, the fruit of their lives shows they don't really know Christ. <clears throat> so this is a warning. We, we see warnings about this in Romans chapter 16, 2 Timothy 3. There's multiple places, but I want to just read these words from Jesus himself. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is terrifying. This is terrifying. I'm reminded of um, the Last Supper when the Lord is with his disciples and he reveals that one of them is going to betray them. And we see in the Gospel of John that they immediately began looking around. Lord, is it me? Lord, please not me. I want to say the Lord gives a stern and stark picture here of those on the last day who will think they're okay. And history, or the end of history and the beginning of eternity will show they are not okay. And so this is, I, I, I want to be tender, but we need to be sober-minded about this. When it comes to growth and progress and maturity in the Christian faith, if you don't see that in your life, now I'm talking about other people, your life then it's a good time to say, Lord, is this me? Lord, is it I? Again, not looking at other people, not thinking about that neighbor, that cousin, that other person you know. No, no, no. Just you and the Lord. Lord, is, is this me? Do I live for the here and now? Is my God actually my belly? Do I set my mind and my heart on the things of this world rather than on the things of heaven? And we need to be honest about the fruit in our lives. And remember, the Holy Spirit, we're, we're a work in progress. As I said, we're all a work in progress. But the Holy Spirit is working on his people. Is the Lord working in your life? Are you more mature in your faith than you were 20, 10, 5, even one year ago? Maybe slightly. Maybe it's barely perceptible. You know what? This is where we need one another. Because sometimes I don't see that I've made any progress in the faith and I'll have other believers come up to me and they will encourage me. And they will point to fruit in my life that maybe I don't even see. And I need them to encourage me. Others of you, maybe you're the opposite. Maybe you feel pretty good about yourself and then other people come along and say, hey, actually, and it causes you to say, you know what, I need to take stock of what they're saying. I need to evaluate what they're telling me. I want to be very careful here because there's a tendency, if we're not careful, to begin applying this to other people rather than ourselves. But I do want to say, let's think soberly, let's not deny scripture. I've been at funerals, you've probably been at funerals, where you know the person in the casket lived a, a tragic life full of sin, full of filthiness. No evidence for decades of anything to do with God, the Lord, Christ. 
And then they'll be laying before their family and friends and the preacher will bring up something that they did or said when they were eight years old and try to give hope and encouragement to the family. But brothers and sisters, those who are Christ, he keeps. And those who are Christ, the Holy Spirit brings to maturity. And so I, I don't have any specifics in mind here, but I want to say when we think about our loved ones, maybe you have loved ones who when they were young, maybe in their 20s, maybe decades ago, made those bold professions of faith. But you look at their lives now and you see no fruit, no evidence. Maybe they wandered or strayed. I want to say to you, have the courage, have the love to go call them back. Don't assume, well, they prayed a prayer when they were eight, so they're okay. Friend, you don't know the sincerity of their heart when they were eight. You don't know what's between another person and God, but you can look at someone's fruit. And if you love them, call them back. It's not too late. No one is too far gone. And if we're going to have Christian maturity, that's what we're going to do. We're going to call one another follow the Lord. We're going to go and put our arm around the man who has strayed. We're going to say, brother, I love you. Come back over here with me. Let's walk away from the edge. You're too close. Let's go back. May the Lord give us courage to have those conversations. I, I do want to say this, though. I, I think it bears emphasizing this. What is our response to people who once made a profession of faith? They were once in the church and now they're nowhere to be seen. Their lives give no evidence of knowing Christ. We don't sit in judgment over them, right? So we're not their judge. God is their judge. But we have to believe what the Bible says about the life of a Christian and what that looks like. We, we don't say, well, the Bible must be wrong because I know my cousin Eddie is actually a Christian because he prayed a prayer. No, we say the Bible is right, and I know Eddie prayed a prayer, but his life doesn't look like he follows Christ. So then how do we respond? We, we have the response that Paul does with tears with tears and then we go pursue them we go try to snatch them out of the fire we pray for them we love them and when they do come back to church we don't joke with them and oh no the ceiling's going to fall in oh we're all going to get struck by lightning no we rejoice because the lamb who had strayed has been brought back the coin that was lost has been found we rejoice I want to challenge us as a church when the wickedest, filthiest sinner you know, that Sunday morning they come and visit. I want you to put your arms around them and love them, welcome them, make them feel glad to be here. This is a hospital for sick sinners. May that be our heart towards those who don't walk with the Lord when they come to him. Well, there's much more in this passage to try to unpack, but for the sake of time, I want to bring it to a conclusion. And just say this. Let us be wise in how we walk. Let us strive toward Christian maturity. Don't be content to have the same level of understanding of the Bible that you had when you were a youngster. Pursue Christ. Pursue knowing Him. Spend time in prayer. Spend time meditating on Scripture. Spend time around other wise and mature believers so that you might grow. Don't be like the 25-year-old who has trouble with adulting, right? Who just because they learn how to load their dishwasher or balance their checkbook, they think they've accomplished something magnificent. No, we can all aspire to Christian maturity. It's not just for the super special saints. It's for all of us. And so, what do we do? Uh, just let me read the last verses here of our passage. Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. We keep our eyes there, don't we? And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And then chapter four, verse one. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for your word. I pray that 
your spirit would apply it to our hearts as we need individually. Lord, help us as a church to love one another and also to aspire to greater heights of Christian maturity. Lord, how that looks in our lives could be different for each of us. Maybe some of us, Lord, need to become more generous with our time and volunteering at church and in the lives of other people. Lord, maybe some of us need to be more generous with our pocketbooks as, as you've gifted us. Lord, maybe some of us just need to spend more time daily in prayer or reading your word. Lord, you know us individually. I pray that your spirit would convict us individually of our sins, even as we sing now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, let's stand together. We're going to sing hymn number 329.